Welcome to the Glazoff Gang. Tonight, a very special episode from Mao to conservatism. And we have a very special guest, John Duffy. He is a film producer, but he's also known as the white boy from the Bronx. <laughs> right? If you say so, <laughs> man. <laughs> no, the man, the myth, the legend. Whatever you, you're going to create but a legend. They, but but you yes, are, true. Very true. true. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, we're focusing in uh, on your life story, but you've got about 10 powerful themes, John, from the Bronx to Hollywood but also from Mao to conservatism. And uh, there's so much to talk about, but today obviously for front page reasons and f because of our themes and our mission, I want to talk about your journey from the left to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, but John, before we get to that, you're, I want the viewers to get a little bit of a sense of your greatness, which I think that it is. I want to begin with a few things that you do. Uh, you line produce the mixed martial arts film Blood and Bone with Michael J. White. Michael, I, Michael J. White, yeah. Yeah, and I just, I, I'm a big fan of his. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, it was a, a film shot here. The director, Ben Ramsey, uh, wrote and directed it. And it was just a, a good experience. And Michael J. is a great guy. He's an incredible martial artist. And a lot of the other martial, mixed martial artists. I was not into mixed martial artists, but watching some of it for the movie. And I got a chance to meet and uh, work with all of them. And they really came and did a great job with us. We had fun. Fun shoot. Absolutely. I know. I, I love. He, he, he played in this one, Undisputed, I think, too, another movie, but that wasn't yours. No. It wasn't, and just, then he did Spawn, and he, he's done yeah. a lot of movies. Very talented yeah. guy and a, and a real nice guy. He's nice like guy a, a you know, a Ch Chuck Norris, Steven Seagal kind of genre. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little bit different, more urban, a little bit more. I mean, mm -hmm. I, like I said, I, I think he's a really good actor, and I had a good time with him. Okay. You all, your television programming includes producing a season of UFO Hunters on the History Channel. Yeah, well, I went to work with a company, but even um, more exciting than that, because that was, you know, it was a, uh, a TV show. But prior to that, we got a chance to, I got a chance to line produce some training videos for the U.S. Marine Corps with that company. And I got a chance to go out to Camp Pendleton, go out to Quantico, and we filmed the Marie, Marines as they went through their training boot camp and, and also their officer training programs. And that was a really uh, moving experience for me because it was the first time I was on military bases and I got to meet some of the best young men and women in my life. And it just uh, kind of impressed me with the type of people who are in the, particularly the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. but in the military and the commitment that they give of their life. It just, uh, it gave me an insight that I had never had on a um, personal basis prior to that. And which also very significant, even the way you're speaking about it, is this is coming from a former Maoist. So that's what I want to get to, a person who has so much respect for American military and, and our soldiers. Um, before we get to our main issue, you see Tony Robbins is an authentic role model and mentor for your life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, he, he was a, he's a, a very unique individual, a motivational coach, um, a life coach. I mean, you can call him a lot of different things, but he's an inspiration. Basically, what he does is he inspires people to be the best they can be, to, be the, to take full responsibility for their lives and to not blame others, your family, life, government. You, you're responsible for your life, and that, taking that 100% responsibility puts you in charge of making your life better or worse, and it's up to you. So when uh, I was working in the post office at the time, I was doing many things. I had went back to school, and I saw a flyer for a fire walk that he did, and I uh, attended it, and we walked on hot coals on 34th Street in Manhattan on a Friday night, and it was a life changer for me. It opened up the possibility of that I could follow my dreams, I could overcome any obstacle that was put forward in life just by going for it. And so, and, and I was skeptical at first because, you know, he's kind of a larger-than-life individual. But coming from where I was from the Bronx and having uh, common sense, I saw that he was really, truly a, a, an authentic person, I, and I really considered him one of my uh, life mentors. And, and John, again, some of the themes there, again, interweave with conservatism and becoming a conservative's individual responsibility instead of scapegoating and blaming social forces in society for one's own life. Well, to give an policy. example, I went to one of his seminars, and at the time I was still, uh, I had given up on communism and I had rejected communism, but I was still infused by a leftist mindset, so to speak, and a utopian mindset. And so when I went to one of Tony Robbins' programs, he had a range of speakers. He had people who were handicapped, who overcame obstacles. But one person at the time, which was a, um, 
a, a, a turning point for me as well. He had a, a veteran who was uh, captured and tortured by the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. Now at that point I was still somewhat of a, a leftist, so when I heard this uh, veteran speak, first I was resistant to the message because I had all the leftist mindset and I was going, ah, this can't be true. And the longer I listened, I realized the truth of what he was saying, and that was a turning point for me, because I realized that the North Vietnamese and the communist point of view, which they had given us this big lie about how they treated everybody, wasn't true. That they had tortured people, that they had murdered people, and basically they had created a nightmare for their own society and for the world. But that Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam veteran who told about his uh, time being a, a, a prisoner in, in Vietnam, was a turning point in my life too. It opened, and it was at a Tony Robbins seminar, and it opened me up to thinking, wow, maybe some of the things I believe have been wrong. And, and very interestingly enough, it, you didn't even go for political reasons. This came through Tony Robbins and the inspirational themes of life and how to live, and it Correct. came through that, which again yeah. is not really a surprise, and we'll get to that. Let's now, we've hit on some major themes that we want to talk about, but let's now go back in the timeline. Uh, growing up in the South Bronx, the son of two Irish immigrants. Can you hold that up for a minute and tell our viewers what it is? This is uh, the Red Book, Chairman Mao. I probably picked this book up when I was 16 years old in the South Bronx, hanging out with the Black Panthers who were at the time selling and promoting uh, Mao's uh, material and Mao's thought. And it was the beginning of my path down to uh, Maoism and communism. Okay, so let's, let's expand a little bit. How did you how did you get into this darkness? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it, I, I was a, a young kid in the South Bronx. I dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old, um, following in my brother's footsteps, so I also dropped out. He was four years older than me. And it, it was a time, it was in the 60s, uh, the neighborhood had changed, and we were one of the only few white families left in the neighborhood, and it had transformed into a black and a Puerto Rican neighborhood. And I was there at a time, and then what the forces started to happen, there was a time in the world that revolution was happening all over the world. And matter of fact, uh, um, I read everything at the time, the Black Panther paper, I read Ramparts magazine, which was put out by uh, David Horowitz. I read everything. I was a, a high school dropout, but I was, uh, I was searching and I was reading anything I could get my hands on. And for some reason, growing up in poverty, I was raised by a mother, basically, my, my dad died. Uh, when I was four, and so we were raised on two, I say two checks, uh, Social Security check and his veterans check, and those were the two checks that kept, kept us alive. So I grew up in poverty, and I was a kid that didn't have any positive role models. I didn't have a Tony Robbins. I didn't have a, a positive entrepreneurs in my life or business people or successful people. So what was around me was a neighborhood that was going through drug addiction, heroin was everywhere, crime. It was, it, it was a, a bad situation. Revolutions seemed like a more positive uh, uh, path than drugs and crime. So at the time, those were the two paths that I saw, and I chose that path of uh, going down the path of revolution and getting involved to try and make a better society, which I thought that was a path, the way to do it as a kid. So, John, a displacement, an alienation in your life, child of immigrants, uh, fatherless. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps searching for a father wanting to belong, wanting to fit in? Well, I think we all, you know, it's why people join gangs, it's why people, you know, it, it, especially young people, why, why this has such an appeal, why utopianism has such an appeal, is that at that point in your life, you don't have a lot of life experience. You don't have a lot to, to judge things on. So if something sounds good, it might be good, right? And you don't, you're not able to compare it to your life experiences. So yes, an alienation, usually that's what gets people, I think, involved in radical movements is alienation of one type or another, you know, whether it's a personal alienation or a group alienation, if you belong to a group that feels alienated. It just depends on what causes that alienation. So for me, yeah, I was an alienated kid, without a doubt. John, Mao. Why Mao? Why, why Maoism? Well, once again, I think it was uh, what was being introduced in my neighborhood. Um, by who? By the Black Panthers, okay. which was uh, 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 pretty much the main uh, force in that neighborhood at the time. And there was a Puerto Rican version of them called the Young Lords as well, which was also into Mao. And there was a split in the communist movement where 
the, there was the, the Soviet type people who supported the Soviet Union, and then there was the Chinese supporters, which was a, a, in opposition to each other. So the communist movement had split between China and Russia, and they were uh, basically fighting against each other at that point. So the Black Panthers had taken the Chinese path of, of uh, believing in Mao Zedong. So that's what they spread into the neighborhood, and uh, some of us got involved. And we were also not just involved in the ideas. We were trying to change things in the neighborhood, get people to stop doing drugs. We were trying to do positive things. So that was what was appealing to me, too, mm -hmm. that there was, an, uh, there was a positive program mm -hmm. on top of, and then on top of it was this ideology. But there was an underlying positive program, which is kind of probably what um, inspired me more than anything else. Well, this is how evil often works in the name of justice, where there is injustice, but then it's always slightly blurred, and there's a monstrosity somewhere lingering there. Agreed. John, were you aware, did you not educate yourself or read further, that you were venerating the greatest mass murder in human history? Mao killed up to 70, 80 million people. Did you know that? No, I mean, like anything, it's like when you, f when you follow an, uh, an ideology, and especially in my case, I mean, I, was, uh, I had not read the alternative points of view. I had not read other kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. You kind of get yourself enmeshed in that, yeah. and you read only that. And you don't want to no. know. Well, it's not so much you don't want to. You, you just you start to you're, become a true believer. And once you're a true believer, you don't want to hear the other side. Mm -hmm. You just want to justify your side. And I led at the age of... 26, I was still a high school dropout. I led a trip to China and um, met with the Chinese leadership. And that, too, there was moments in that trip where I started to question that what China presented on the surface was, was not what was behind the surface. That was the be another beginning of you a You were a fellow traveler. You know, a, a, a believer, a true believer. John, when you... Did you know who the Black Panthers really were? Would, when did you begin to understand what Huey Newton and the rest, you know, th these were gangsters. These were, were killers. Well, once again, you don't, most people don't see that. that, that uh, years ago, I read a book called Will You Die For Me, uh, which was written by a Black Panther who, former Black Panther, who was basically, he was the um, underground thug army uh, for Huey P. Newton and basically killed people, ran the drug trades, uh, shook down prostitutes for money. Yeah. But that wasn't a, it, the media never shared any of this. Mm -hmm. This was all hidden information. Mm -hmm. And so this guy kind of revealed it on a level, you, that was the truth, what was behind Huey P. Newton. Mm -hmm. But on the surface, once again, he was portraying himself as a social justice uh, mm -hmm. advocate to make society better. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he was a, a cocaine addict, yeah. he was running drugs, and he was doing a lot of uh, uh, horrible things in his community, as well as killing people. And, and John, you know, I guess what I'm kind of, what I've always been fascinated with is, uh, you know, that, that journey of, of the leftist and the political pilgrim, but how they are tricked by the deceivers, but how they also want to be deceived, and how they don't, they, you know, the evidence is there for people to investigate, they just don't investigate it. Because the evidence is there, and was there. It's just, that's what I'm interested in. Well, well you know, there's, but, there's different types, I mean, I, I, I'm, I was kind of unusual in the movement, in the sense that I think the majority of the left movement, or, or Maoist movement in particular, was made up of more uh, privileged middle class kids who were in many cases rebelling against mm -hmm, their parents. Mm -hmm. I wasn't one of those, I was a yeah, poor kid. Yeah. So there was a, a small handful of poor people who got involved in the movement, but in general it was mainly made up of middle class privileged people who had college educations, who came from yeah, well off experiences. And, and here's a good story you, you may enjoy. As a 17 year old kid I went to a program in, in Manhattan at the time, because I was trying to figure out which groups to join and which groups uh, was uh, legitimate and real and on that movement. And there was uh, two speakers at that program, uh, Bernadine Dawn and uh, Bill Ayers of The Weatherman. And they gave a speech, and I was trying to figure out what I thought of The Weatherman, because they were one of the forces at the time. And when they finished the speech, they basically, Charlie Manson had just killed all those people in California. So Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dawn and the rest of the weather uh, people gave the um, Charlie Manson salute, pitchfork salute. And at that point, I realized everything I needed to know about them, that they were basically evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have anything to do with them yeah. as human beings. And so my opinion of them, even in those days, hasn't changed to what I think of them today. And so, John, you're helping me here with the transition because perhaps I've mistimed this a little bit. We need two episodes because we're actually running out of time now. But I wanted to do your conversion 
but you started it for me. Now, with the three minutes we have left, uh, you weren't afraid, like a lot of people would blind themselves to that, but you began to see this at the Tony Robbins conference, and now, as you're saying, the sign that these particular uh, terrorists or revolutionaries held up. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey out of the left and out of Maoism and towards conservatism. Well, there was a couple of different things. One, uh, when I left the Maoist movement, the Maoist movement started collapsing. Uh, when China, when Deng Xiaoping came into China, there was basically, they started to move towards a capitalist economy. And so with that, the commun international Maoist movement pretty much went through a crisis of, of identity. Um, at that point, I realized, I started to question it, and I rejected communism and rejected all the things, the dictatorship of the proletariat, all the ideology that they had. So I rejected that, but then I kind of was like not sure what I was anymore. I was kind of lost. And then it was trying to find what do I believe in, what, what's legitimate, what do I accept. And then it was a, a, um, different experiences. And some of it was getting older, becoming more mature. Some was the Tony Robbins experience and realizing that, that we're responsible for our lives and not government and not respecting big government. And obviously, in the case of communism, it's even worse because they created nightmares. Like you said, Mao Zedong killed 50 million people. Pol Pot, I knew people who were um, Cambodian students who supported Pol Pot. They asked them, the students, to come back to Cambodia to help their revolution, Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge. The students flew back to Cambodia, got off the plane, and he had them killed on the runway people I knew. That was another thing that showed me what monstrosity of, of evil communism was. So there was moments that got me to go, no, this is wrong. This is, but then 9-11 is the final piece. When 9-11 happened, I, it made me realize, because I, I hung with Iranian students, left-wing Iranian students. I hung with uh, uh, Arab radicals. I hung with everybody on the radical front. 9-11 happened was the final transition for me because I identified when my city was attacked, because I was a New Yorker, and my country was attacked. Put on an American flag, a pin for the first time, and I had people call me a Nazi, some of my friends, for doing that. That went, whoa. And it, that was a final point. And then I started looking back and say, okay, what did you believe? And it was like, wrong, wrong, wrong. So I could, went through all my belief systems, realized what I believed wrong, and had to re-transform uh, myself and come up with new belief systems of who I am as a person today. And that was how I made the conversion. And, and not, I would say 9-11 was the final piece, but there was, you know, stepping stones on the way. Under 30 seconds, when you meet a leftist today who's very excited about Obama and the left, what would you say to them? Well, I come from my experience and I tell people, I, I look at, I grew up in the South Bronx, which is similar to Detroit, and I just say, look at 50 years of certain kinds of programs. When I, when I was in the South Bronx, Lyndon Johnson started the war on poverty. Poverty's still there. Those, you look at Detroit and say that's a role model for government involvement in trying to fix things. What do they do? Make it worse. That's the reality. You look at Detroit. If that's your model, that's what you're going to get is, is Detroit. Fascinating conversation. I'd like to continue this at a future time. And Anytime we also time. get need to get to something else. I've heard from many people that anyone is yet to beat you in one-on-one -on -one in basketball. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm not sure about that, but I love to play. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. John Duffy, me. ladies and gentlemen, and we'll see you next week on the Glass Off Gang. Good night.